Welcome to Retain Kentucky Inclusive Strategies to Recruit and Retain Employees. I am Kimberly Wickert from the University of Kentucky Human Development Institute and Retain Kentucky. My preferred pronouns are she, her, hers, and I am a mid-career white woman with blonde hair and glasses uh, in a ponytail today. I'm wearing a black and white pattern short sleeve shirt and have a virtual blue retain background. I'll review a few housekeeping items before we get started today. The captioning feature is enabled, but you can disable it if you wish to do so. We will also be monitoring the Q&A and chat box throughout the presentation. So please put any questions or comments there so you can join in our discussion. And um, we welcome you to do that as, as we go along. You'll also be receiving a survey following the presentation today. And we appreciate your willingness to take just a few minutes and provide us with feedback on the presentation and help us plan for future presentations. We'll also be placing a link to Retain Kentucky Media in the chat, and this recording can be found there. So the information that we're providing today and accompanying materials is intended for informational purposes only and does not necessarily reflect the views or opinions of the University of Kentucky Human Development Institute or its individual employees. Although we attempt to provide accessible, accurate, and current information, no guarantees are made to that effect. I would like to ask you to mark your calendars to join us for our July Employment Seminar Series entitled Identifying and Developing Bench Strength in Your Workforce. It'll be on July 12th from noon to 1230 Eastern Time. And there is a link that we will be putting in the chat. Brandon's going to put it in there for us a little bit later that you can um, register. So today we are going to define inclusion as well as actions of inclusivity as, and also increasing inclusion in the recruitment and onboarding process, as well as ways to promote inclusion in the retention of your workers. I'm really um, excited and appreciative to have Dr. Nicholas Wright as our um, subject matter expert today. Dr. Wright has his PhD and is a champion of diversity, equity, inclusion, and accessibility. He's also a nationally recognized award-winning higher education leader, scholar, and practitioner that excels at making connections and building an inclusive environment. Dr. Wright is the Director of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion for the Human Development Institute at the University of Kentucky. And so welcome Dr. Wright, we're so glad to have you with us today. I'm gonna um, ask you to go ahead and kick us off with this next slide with the um, definition of inclusion and, and how this may translate in the workplace. Yeah, so thank you so much for that introduction, Kimberly. I appreciate the introduction and I appreciate just the invitation to be here and to talk a little bit more about diversity, equity, and inclusion. As Kimberly said, my name is Dr. Nicholas Wright. I am the Director of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion here at the Human Development Institute for the University of Kentucky. I use pronouns he, him, and his, and a visual description of myself is I'm a multiracial man in his upper 20s with short black hair, uh, facial hair, a uh, blue hair, blue colored shirt, a silver tie, and a blue background. I want to make sure that we can talk a little bit more about inclusion. We can speak about that and inclusive cultures, especially in the workplace, because that's something that's important. As we talk about it, inclusion refers to all people being included or having access and equal opportunity in the space or the space that we occupy. Inclusion is important in all areas of our life, but especially in the workplace. The reason why it's so important in the workplace is because of how much time that we spend here. A large portion of our life is here spent in the workplace. On the screen, you can see, and you may be able to notice a word cloud that's here. And if you're familiar with word clouds, you know a little bit about them. But the topic is inclusion. And surrounding the word inclusion, 
there are other words that are there related to inclusion. And you may notice that some words are larger than what others are. And the reason why that is, is because they were words that were added multiple times because of the relevance, because of the reference that it has with inclusion. Some of these words are diversity, disability, equality, and respect. When we discuss inclusion in the workplace, we're referring to the environment where all employees are supported, valued, and respected. The workplace with inclusion in mind fosters a culture that embraces diversity and ensures that every single person has equal opportunity to participate and contribute. This isn't a situation where people should feel respected regardless of their identities. It's a place where people feel respected, including their identities, including everything that they bring to work with them. In order for us to have an inclusive workplace, you have to embrace diversity, ensure equity, value differences, engage employees, work towards accessibility by removing barriers and raise awareness through education. We also have to have leadership that promotes inclusive practices. That's how we have that inclusive culture because that's something that will lead to employee satisfaction, engagement, productivity, creativity, and will also achieve the goals that we're working towards, such as attracting and retaining the talent with a broad perspective and array of talents. This is what we're focused on today. We're gonna to focus on this and as we discuss inclusion in the workplace setting, that's what we hope to accomplish. Thank you so much and um, I'm, I'm very appreciative and fortunate to be a, a member of HDI's workforce and to be under your leadership with your DEI initiatives. And um, later in our presentation, we're gonna get a sneak peek of just a few of your strategies that you've implemented in the short amount of time that you've been with us. So I was driving this past weekend and it was really timely, but I saw this billboard and um, since I was driving, I, I, I didn't capture it exactly, but it, it said something to the effect of what this slide says. In order to hire a great candidate, you need to give traditional hiring strategies a day off. And it really captures what we're gonna review today and how using non-traditional hiring strategies can increase inclusion in the recruitment and retention of your workers. So listed here, we have job posting, job description, application, and interview. And we also have um, uh, ways in the recruiting process that we're gonna review that employers and workforce professionals can increase inclusion through these strategies that we're gonna outline. According to LinkedIn, people view jobs on mobile devices more than 50% of the time. So this graphic shows a, a weathered help wanted sign, a white background with um, red weathered letters, uh, all bold capital. Um, and one of the things that I think it you know, calls out is how are we reaching out in our job postings to individuals? So consider using bold text and bullet points to make the most important information easily scannable on small screens and post your open role on mobile responsive job boards. This is also an area where traditional strategies like this window sign or a newspaper or radio ad may reach individuals that have limited internet accessibility. So while we're talking about non-traditional strategies um, today, you may still wanna um, think about those traditional strategies that are gonna reach a larger candidate pool as well. We have focused on inclusive job descriptions in past employment seminar series. And you can take a deeper dive into that on our Retain Kentucky Media website if you weren't able to hear that previously. But just a quick reminder here that including the physical, mental, and psychosocial aspects of a job will allow you to attract candidates who can make an informed decision about the essential functions of the position including environmental considerations like lighting, temperature, noise, dust, and fumes are also important that because they allow applicants to decide if the position is a good match for them. Another um, point here is language usage in the job description should avoid gendered terms, be available in multiple languages, 
and checked for the reading level to attract a larger pool of candidates. So this is our um, diversity statement specific to essential functions. And while an employer should give applicants the information needed to make an informed decision, like I just shared in the job posting and job description, at HDI, we're very proud of our diversity statement here. And it states that the position will advance HDI's mission and strategic plan. While the position includes physical, psychosocial, and cognitive requirements, reasonable accommodations may allow for essential functions related to the position to be performed in a variety of ways. In alignment with HDI core values, this position will contribute to a workplace in which individual differences are recognized, appreciated, respected, and responded to in ways that fully develop and utilize each per person's talents and strengths. And Dr. Wright, I think you were instrumental in helping um, develop this statement. And so I'm gonna turn it over to you to, uh, to share some more. Yeah, so thank you, Kimberly. I know that when it comes to that diversity statement, how important it is. Um, and I think that when we think of diversity statements, they're great ways to effectively and efficiently communicate employers' commitment to diversity, equity, and inclusion, and do it in a public way as well. Uh, diversity statements, as we're thinking about them, they're great ways to also attract diverse talent, and also communicate the company's values and, and build trust and credibility around along potential applicants that are here. Diversity statements are also important because there's something that is more than just a, a public display of a commitment that's there, but they also should guide the decision making in the company. They should also support accountability in the company that's there. It's important that these are just more than statements, that they're more than just words that are here, but it's a company's actions, it's a company's initiatives. In order for diversity statements to work, diversity commitments to actually work, that they have to have positive growth and they have to be accompanied by tangible actions that are in here, but also some initiatives that fully support the inclusive work cultures and the inclusive climates in that way that we can actually build those. Thank you. We're gonna go ahead and talk about ways that we can continue with inclusivity in the application process and, and increase inclusion by providing large print um, in the application and even in the interview process, if there are um, hard copy um, forms that need to be completed. You can also um, provide online options as well. Using an accessibility checker is a great way to be able to um, increase inclusivity and also universal design principles to ensure that it can be accessed, understood, and used to the greatest extent possible by all people, regardless of their age, size, ability, or disability. And so I know, again, you know, um, Dr. Wright has been uh, a leader for us. And, and as we were planning this as well, you've said to me, you know, this is how this is how we do this at HDI. And we're always looking at um, how we're how we're improving and and in inclusive measures. So speaking to what you just said, the actions in our diversity statement. So from the application, we're gonna move on to the interview process. And some employers have created an accommodation specialist position that also helps applicants in the interview process. This is a non-traditional strategy to increase inclusion. So if someone needs to confirm physical accessibility prior to an interview, request an accommodation like a quiet room for interviewing or an interpreter, the accommodation specialist could then support them in that process. Having the initial interview in a virtual format can also increase accessibility for individuals. According to accessibility.com, too often employers treat the interview process as a way to weed out candidates until the best one is left standing. However, you might wanna consider looking at these non-traditional strategies to get better results with an adjustment to your thinking. Conduct your interviews in a way that allow your candidates to showcase their skills and knowledge and let them show you what they're capable of. This way you are gonna be able to hire the most qualified candidate for the job. 
ask the person how they would perform the essential functions to allow them to showcase their talent and to consider other ways that the task may be completed. Traditional interview expectations may test candidates by putting them on the spot to see how they respond to questions or situations during the interview process. Inclusive strategies allow them to prepare by knowing what to expect during the interview, such as who will be part of the interview, what will take place during the interview, where the interview will take place, and how long it will last. Giving interview questions ahead of time is also something that you may want to consider as well as using open-ended questions. So we introduced the accommodation specialist in the last slide in the recruitment process. And according to the Americans with Disabilities Act, potential employers cannot ask disability-related questions before an offer is made. However, this doesn't mean you can't accommodate your candidates with disabilities throughout the interview process. The statement on this slide is one that we created that can be modified to meet the needs of a specific organization or an employer that will allow an applicant to know they can request additional accessibility during the recruitment process. Before doing so, uh, you may want to consult with your human resource department and or legal counsel. And I'm gonna go ahead and just read this um, in case uh, someone is calling in today. It says, we promote inclusion and accessibility in our organization, including during the recruitment and hiring process. Applicants are not required to disclose disabilities and any voluntarily disclosed disability will not be used to discriminate against you in the hiring process. In order to ensure that all prospective employees are able to participate fully in the interview process, we offer reasonable accommodations if you need them to participate in the interview. If you would like to make an accessibility request for your interview process, please contact, and then you can put your uh, accommodation specialist or whoever would be assisting with that, their name and phone number. So just another way to have that statement out there, like you mentioned, Dr. Wright, um, to, to show the community, the public, um, but again, you know, it goes back to what you've shared, um, actions as well. So we've talked about the application, we've talked about the interview. And so once we've hired candidates and we get to the onboarding process, this is really important um, to make them feel welcome and make them feel included. And again, this is an area where um, at HDI, we continue to, uh, to be able to, I think, lead the charge. And so we're gonna talk about this for um, for a few minutes. And I do have a question um, asking about um, the ability to use an adapted use of the statement for their company. Absolutely, if you would like to use that, again, the disclaimer is make sure that you run that past your HR or legal department. Um, but we are um, glad that we are helping, helping inclusivity for um, other employers and workforce professionals as well. So Dr. Wright, a lot of these um, things listed here are things that again, um, I know that you've helped lead the initiative within the Human Development Institute, but um, as far as making people feel welcome, introducing them when they um, are onboarded within our organization, um, we have something that we do that's a three minute drill and I don't know, did you have the opportunity to, to participate when you were uh, new to HDI and do the three minute drill? I did not. I didn't get an opportunity to do the three minute drill, but I've witnessed plenty of them and it's a great way just to uh, get connected with new employees. It really is. And it's um, it's nice to learn about, you know, their their work uh history and, and where they've been before us and also some of their, their uh, leisure activities as well. If you have an, a coworker that you can um, have them reach out to someone prior to start and just let them know that they're really looking forward to that individual coming on board, that's always very welcoming. 
putting new employees, colleagues, associates in a newsletter that you may have, um, that is also a welcome measure during onboarding. If you have a mentor program and somebody can be in that program um, and, and connect them with someone who can be there to answer questions, um, you know, where do I find extra um, supplies? Where can I order supplies? Uh, where do I need to park if it's, uh, you know, if, if there's overflow parking? Questions like that um, can be helpful as well. We did have a question about the three minute drill and I don't know if we answered it, but basically it's during our um, HDI staff meetings and they are virtual and new uh, employees have three minutes where they're asked questions by usually one of our human resource associates and um, we just get to know them better. And so um, it may sound a little om ominous maybe because we use the word drill, but it's really just a few minutes where we get to um, meet those individuals and they get to introduce themselves. Yeah, thank you, Kimberly. And I know that, that Rachel asked that question, but I'm sure that other people wanted to learn about it as well. And with that three minute drill, it allows people the opportunity to give more than just their professional title that's there. It allows them to be personal. It allows them to, to discuss some of their hobbies, some of their interests, and some of their motivation as well. So it's a great way to introduce them to the uh, entire organization. And then also those follow-up meetings that are there or those spotlights that are there or those ways of colleagues reaching out to them, that's a great way for them to get connected. Because I think that as we think about it, in order for onboarding to be successful, it's something that is important that we pay attention to it and we take that time because successful onboarding is something that's crucial. Because in, in this time of transition, it's something that can make the difference between successfully retaining an employee and also not doing so, not doing that. Um, individuals having those support networks, especially when uh, they are built in, something that's more structured, it's something that's incredibly beneficial, such as the three minute drill, but also the mentoring. I know on the screen, the information about the mentoring program that's there and mentoring is something that builds in a support network and it's something that's mutually beneficial for both the mentor and the mentees. And we understand that not everyone is gonna participate in the mentoring, that's fine. We understand that not everyone um, I think not too many people have extra time on their hands with it, but having that mentoring program in there, what it does, it's an opportunity to combat isolation and also increases belonging for both the mentor and the mentee. So that's a, just a great way for onboarding. Yeah, absolutely. And, and also one of the other things that we talked about is potentially doing a scavenger hunt. And that's something that could be done in person if somebody is actually working um, on site at an employer or in a virtual capacity as well. And it just gets, it allows the, the individual to get to know coworkers as well as um, where they may be able to access resources within the organization. So one of the things that we wanted to share is um, a strategy by which you may want to create, we, we call them bios at HDI, we have bios of, of everyone on our website, but this is a little bit of a deeper dive that you may want to do within your department or smaller work groups. And my colleague Shirley Cron brought this to my attention after she participated in a professional development presentation and they shared this, this is Biodex and the resource is going to be um, in the chat that Brandon's gonna, gonna put up. Um, but it's basically a user manual that um, can be designed for teammates to empower diverse work teams to work together efficiently and effectively. And so in organizations, when new colleagues join a team, there's that getting to know you period. That can be stressful and sometimes inefficient for the group um, while people try to figure out how to work with each other. So employers can use this type of format or create their own as we have done at HDI, where employees can develop a bio or user manner that's manual that sort of lets each other know the best ways to contact them, their working styles, their learning styles, how they prefer to receive feedback. 
And so I really liked this and wanted to share this example. And, and I had shared with you, Dr. Wright, as we were planning for today, I had an experience where I really felt like a user manual would have been helpful for me early in my career as a supervisor. Um, one of my team members started working and she was a seasoned um, professional. She was a case manager. And um, once she completed orientation, she began working and after a couple of days, she called me and asked, is everything okay? Uh, do I still have a job? And, and I kind of, you know, took a pause for a minute and she shared that her previous manager called her multiple times throughout the day to provide direction and ask questions about her work. And so I shared with her that I would check in with her weekly as she was a seasoned professional, but she was welcome to contact me anytime if she needed my support. And, and I think back, if we would have had a user manual or something like this, um, she would have known what, you know, what my um, user manual was, and I would have known what, what hers were as well. And it probably would have avoided, you know, that situation. So um, I just think it's something fun to consider too. I'm going to go ahead and show this is the second part. This is by Ultranauts. And again, this is in the um, in the chat as well. But you can see here, even you know, the, the ways supervisor and colleagues can assist. That would have been really helpful for me to know in my situation I just described, how people like to get feedback um, publicly, the timing of it, the delivery of it, how you frame it, and then just other types of things that would be helpful to know. So yet another strategy to think about for inclusivity during the, the retention, onboarding and retention process, really. So Dr. Wright, I'm going to ask you to share with us some of these inclu inclusive retention strategies listed here, because these are, once again, things that you're leading for us, and I know from a university perspective, are involved in as well. Yeah, yeah. So when we're talking about these inclusive retention strategies, we have to understand that once employers recruit excellent candidates, the work isn't finished. The work isn't finished just because we hire them, that it's important that our job just doesn't stop when we recruit, but it's important that we retain them as well. And on the screen are just some strategies for companies to use to effectively retain employees. And we're talking about diversity, equity, and inclusion committees. And what they do is that they empower individuals. They allow opportunities for people with a common focus to come together to support one another and the company as a whole. And it's important to, to give these opportunities for their opinions and their initiatives to be shared across the company. Also, employee resource groups. Those can also be known as employee affinity groups. And that these, what they do is they bring together employees with shared identities to share resources with one another, advocate for one another, and do this in more of a united way as well. That way they have strength. And it's also important to have ongoing professional development opportunities because the growth doesn't stop just because you're hired. We want to continue to develop employees and treat them as lifelong learners. And this is something that's going to promote growth in the workforce, um, but, but really in their personal and professional development that it's ongoing. And then finally, I just want to talk about the initiative that we implemented here at the Human Development Institute, which is the diversity and inclusion calendar um, that we're going to talk about in the next slide. And here in front of you is the diversity and inclusion calendar. It really just gives updates. And it's a simple way to have a learning opportunity. Um, but what it does is it gives learning opportunities for those who may not know about some of these holidays that are in there, but it also validates individuals' experiences. And what it is that each month, uh, we send out at the beginning that each month we have events, holidays, and acknowledgements are sent out to all employees. And with this, we understand that for some people, they're gonna have this and they're just gonna delete it. And they're gonna think nothing of it. But for some people, they're gonna feel more validated. They're gonna feel seen. They're gonna feel that this is something that maybe the first time that their holiday has been sent out to everyone or people know about their um, holidays or celebrations or acknowledgements. I think that overall, this is just a small initiative that employers can do to increase sense of belonging and retain employees. And that's all employees. Absolutely. And thank you so much for sharing this. And um, 
I know I appreciate seeing this every month when you send this out to all of us as well. And one of the things that you've shared with us with the DEI committee is, you know, it's a moving target. So can you share with us how employers and employees need to look at constantly evolving to meet the needs of the workplace and workers? Yeah, yeah, definitely can. So I think that as we think about it, of course, um, we've been, this has been expressed to me several times that people may struggle or they have a challenge with it because they feel that DEI is a moving target. And I understand that you feel that way. I understand that some people feel that way because um, we understand that diversity and inclusion is something that's constantly growing and we have to adapt to meet the needs of our employees. It's something that we have to do and that way we can be have that sense of inclusion. I mean, when we think about diversity, equity, and inclusion, it's different today than what it was 10 years ago. And also in that fact as well, we gotta think that in 10 years, it's gonna be different than what it is today. And it's important to engage in this and also have that ongoing developmental opportunities, not just for some, but for all individuals to have that ongoing uh, development opportunities to, to learn and to grow and to adapt. That's the importance of being that lifelong learner and to prepare not just for today, but for tomorrow. Because if we can take it upon ourselves to pursue these educational developmental opportunities, if we can do this, then that's something that will ensure that we meet the needs of our staff that we work with. And that way we can actually create that culture of inclusion. Because by, by doing that right now, right there, and having those engagement opportunities and those lifelong learners, doing that is how we're going to actually reach our goals. And that way we can actually recruit and retain employees. Thank you so much, Dr. Wright, for sharing. Um, we, like I said, we, we had got some sneak peeks today at some of the, the strategies for um, inclusion in the recruitment and onboarding and retention process. So um, we really appreciate you sharing what you have, have helped us at the Human Development Institute at the University of Kentucky. And I know we're a couple minutes over, but just a reminder that at Retain Kentucky, we can also help participants, employers, and workforce professionals um, in inclusion in the workplace. So feel free to reach out to us. The information is listed here. And uh, again, this will all be on the Retain Kentucky media site in a few days. Thank you so much, Dr. Ray. Thank you everyone for spending some time with us today and I uh, hope you have a wonderful rest of your day.